And now we're handing over to uh, Bob Dotan. For me, it's a really pleasure because when I was starting to work 15 years ago on the Romanian Holocaust in Transnistria, I was searching for photos. It was just one photo I found in Gat Vashem, and all the other photos I've seen was from the ghetto uh, fighter's house where you work, uh, used to work before. And so it's really an honor for me, and it was beautiful work you've done there, the materials you uh, put up and, and uh, make publicly viewable. So really thankful for that. You're now uh, making your uh, PhD at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and you talk about digital Holocaust educational and uh, focusing on survivors and liberators in Nebraska. And so from, it's as well like talking about Brazilian and, and commemoration in, uh, of uh, Nazi Germany and now about in Nebraska, I've never seen that kind of work, and so I'm really interested in looking, really looking forward for your, for your talk. No, uh, we're just okay. looking for the, the remote control. No, this is the scene my Maybe it's there. Uh, yeah. You want to stand up? So first of all, um, thank you all for being here still at the end of this day. And I'd really like to sincerely thank the conference organizers for including uh, my submission from Nebraska uh, in this group of researchers and experts uh, in digital Holocaust memory. Um, I want to make sure I know how to do this. I have great, uh, greatly appreciated the work of the European Holocaust uh, research infrastructure, finding it a model for Holocaust research, and especially in my um, work in uh, uh, digital humanities. Bringing but a small piece of my work to this forum is very meaningful to me, and I hope despite my location in the world, you will all benefit from the, the broader transnational reach of this digital humanities tools that I share with you today. In a few words about myself, I'm a doctoral candidate, as you heard. Um, I worked uh, developing Holocaust educational frameworks um, for the past 25 years and prior, and also during that time at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. I can't take credit for the uh, archive there, but um, I worked in the international department and had a lot of contact with the, uh, with the archive and the amazing um, artifacts at the museum. My project, uh, that I've started with my doctorate um, has become cross-disciplinary in the College of Education and in the um, arts and science through political science, history, digital humanities, and more. I've had the honor of working with the political science professor Ari Cohen um, as my co-project investigator and serving on our project as an advisor, Professor Ger uh, Gerald Steinacker, who has also been a um, a fellow here at the, the Wiesenthal Center. Um, one of the ways that we strive for equitable standards in the US, as I'm sure you may know, is that sometimes we recognize what usually is not recognized. And so I thought it would be important to bring um, this to my talk. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Nebraska is a public land grant institution with campuses and programs across the state that reside on the past, present, and future homelands of the Pawnee, Ponca, Oto, Missouri, Omaha, Dakota, Lakota, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Kaw peoples, as well as the relocated Ho Chunk, Winnebago, Iowa, Sac, and Fox peoples. So many, many indigenous communities who lived in these lands before we were there. We take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together and allow us to better understand that our opportunity to impact the state of Nebraska is a result of the native and indigenous people's past experiences that inform our past, present, and future. And we pay respect to those native elders. As a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska, I've been provided the opportunity to acquire new knowledge and to broaden, broaden my scope of Holocaust education pedagogy and methodology, as well as Holocaust memory. 
through the diverse perspectives of and background of my faculty in, in the teacher preparation program and the tools of digital humanities, I can begin to bring a richer understanding and more grounded experience to those who delve into this material in my state and elsewhere. Nebraska has been uh, a refugee state, keeping us mindful that we bear a responsibility to build and teach respect for differences and the heritage of those who live within our communities. This was the wish of those who survived the Holocaust and settled as our neighbors and those individuals who were called to serve in the armed forces. Our project has been developed by a team of about seven programmers in the Center for Digital Research in Humanities, uh, the acronym CDRH, which is part of the University of Nebraska library systems. Beyond the courses taught by Professor Steinacher, who I mentioned before, and others, there is not a Center for Holocaust Studies at the university. Therefore, I vacillate between programs and philosophies, and they're not quite sure what to do with me in certain ways. For more than 20 years, UNL has used digital humanities methodologies and tools to create a unique digital archive for, used by researchers, scholars, and gen, the general public. And you can see some of the um, projects, the Walt Whitman Archive, the Willa Cather Archive, and others um, that have long aggregated materials from disparate repositories into cohesive, easily navigable websites. UNL has a tradition of involving student and community collaborators in developing and applying computational tools in the digital environment. Students are trained to follow exacting international metadata standards, and this takes place under the direction of our university professors. And such, the Nebraska Stories of Humanity project has also trained student assistants under established guidelines of the CDRH and are carefully monitored. Additionally, the project engages individual contributors, local stakeholders, um, local, like local stakeholder organizations, and national and international repositories. As Jerome McGann states, quote, digital humanists have seen themselves with a longer tradition of the humanities, suggesting that the main value of their work resides in creation, migration, or preservation of cultural materials, unquote. Along with utilizing the resources from existing, already existing APIs, our project is taking an API first approach, hopefully. <laughs> the API first approach to creating TEI encoded digital editions offers tangible interfaces to textual data that can be used in tailor-made workflows by human, humanities researchers and others well suited to distant reading techniques, um, statistics, computer-assisted semantic annotation. By focusing on APIs first, we are encoding the documents, understanding that they will be removed from the site structure, but that they will retain file content. Subsequently, the APIs will create duality in acquiring and sharing archival information, hopefully someday in the future. So my uh, research considers how can we create a digital repository exploring the impact and legacy of Nebraska Holocaust survivors and liberators of World War II Nazi concentration camps while providing critical theoretical framing in collective historical memory? The Nebraska Stories of Humanity website centralizes access to the history of Nebraska Holocaust survivors and World War II liberators of Nazi camps in a collection of searchable stories in aggregate. This endeavor addresses an avenue to re reimagine the use of archival materials of Nebraska survivors or veteran stories to transform the way, uh, to transform the way we interact with Holocaust doc documentation, which was a concept that explored at a Yad Vashem conference in 2020. Um, and the CDRH has provided the venue to assemble multiple tools to accomplish the goals dedicated to the immediate Nebraska community and the collective web audience. Digital compilation of community-centered stories unifies these disparate historical resources. 
The site is populated through locally acquired digital documents, photographs, heirlooms from the families, in addition to uh, researched articles, testimony, geographical, and primary resources. Our work is locally focused, but the digital options allow our collection to be transnational, transcultural, and interdisciplinary as a contribution to public history. These aggregated resources allow access to information through different digital humanities repositories, and we hope to continue to develop them as we go forward. We greatly appreciate the day when international virtual authority files can share APIs to further substantiate the materials. Meanwhile, um, centering the unique stories through our collection of searchable resources preserves the memories of these particular individuals. Um, we've highlighted five individuals thus far in the project um, that has been funded through a variety of different um, uh, funders. And um, one of the things that we hope to do is to enable the users to understand the deconstruction of democracy in pre-World War II Europe and exemplify the power of an individual's resistance in our communities. Pedagogue Ivan Illich claimed that technologies could guide the reconstruction of education to serve the need of varied communities to promote democracy and social justice. The portal is also a bridge to learn about marginalized cultural groups that settled in Nebraska using critical educational theories and multidirectional memory, which has been mentioned a couple of times uh, in these past few days, to connect Holocaust pedagogy to state educational standards. Our project has the potential to adapt diverse interfacing to store and sort essential information as we develop more innovative ways to rely on our digital storytelling. Hmm. Maybe not. There. Okay. Multidirectional memory is a concept coined, again, by Michael, Michael Rothberg. Um, and can help deliver the scaffolded knowledge in considering the trauma of marginalized peoples in Nebraska. We live on the indigenous people's ancestral lands, owning a responsibility to acknowledge other historical tragedies and survival. Additionally, Nebraska has encouraged the integration of the rest refugees' communities, and therefore, we need to assist in multiple language learners and cultures in our schools, districts, and in institutions of higher learning. Thus, when studying about those who experienced the Holocaust, we might also leverage learning about Nebraska, Nebraska as a re, uh, refugee receiving site. For example, you see pic a picture here of Kitty Williams, uh, who was an Auschwitz survivor from Hungary, embracing opportunities to support and share presentation time with Shirin Ibrahim, Ibrahim a survivor of the ISIS Yazidi, uh, Yazidi community who settled, of all places, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, whereas Rothberg acknowledges that memory competition does exist, he reminds us that multidirectional memory can serve as a spur to unexpected acts of empathy and solidarity and can be the very grounds on which people construct um, and act upon visions of justice. Um, I'm going to keep going. Uh, there, he mentioned also that W.E.B. Du Bois uh, spoke about his, um, he was an Afri African American writer who was in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1949 and spoke about how seeing the area of the Warsaw, the Jewish ghetto, was complete, still completely destroyed, whereas the old city was being reconstructed before the Jewish um, uh, section of the, of the city. So this is our, um, uh, one of the pages we just launched two weeks ago um, with this site. And um, independent of the Holocaust story, the survivor story, and during historical ramifications regarding racism and anti-Semitism associated with being Jewish in white America often lies below the surface. So why is it important at all to bring a site like this to Nebraska of all places or, or besides. Um, despite acceptance and tolerance, anti-Semitism anti is, as you know, uh, still exists and, does not, um, and is not only promoted among virulent 
radical white supremacist groups in the United States and certainly here in Europe, but it is also displayed in social media and public discourse of all kinds. Our site hopes to provide insight into the lives of those who withstood humanity's unthinkable destruction, where finding the inner strength to move forward and start anew in Nebraska. This introductory prototype of five highlighted individuals provides the framework for an expanded collection of stories, and we are honored to bring this first phase to the project um, and anticipate many more additions in the future. The Nebraska stories have um, had numerous successes in the past two years of development, um, including over 900 um, items that have been populated, and within that there are many, many more dozens of pages that have been transcribed. Our search engine is, is designed to enhance searchable categories through um, various uh, 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 exploration, as you can see, and through the commitment of our devoted interns um, and the development team, we are able to continue to grow the mass of material that we have. Among our collection of the portal are remarks um, of a talk given by a survivor, Irving Shapiro, of Garing, Nebraska. And if you remember that little map that was in the middle, little Nebraska, um, he settled in the far west corner. We were condemned to die without judge or jury. Very seldom did we find a neighbor whose door we could knock, um, whose door we could knock and ask for shelter. Let us not forget our brothers and sisters who still fill the skies with their smoke. By our deeds, let us make sure that such a holocaust, um, the darkest memory of history and man shall never be allowed to happen again. Settling in western Nebraska, Irving, his wife Clara, and children were among few Jewish families and the only Holocaust survivors. In Gehring, Irving became well -known, a well-known businessman integrating new immigrants from Latino countries into his workplace. He understood the plight of the immigrant, the refugee, in a new land. From 1942 to 1945, Irving was in numerous camps, including Majdanek, Auschwitz, uh, Buna Manowitz, Dora, Middlebau. But he lost his brother when he first got to Majdanek in the very beginning, and he spent the rest of his life searching for his brother. Unfortunately, he passed away before he discovered him, and then uh, Bad Arlson opened up, and um, his son was actually able to find the whereabouts of uh, Irving's brother, who had died in the last days of the war. Um, and we're still transcribing some of those materials, but it's just such a great connection. Although in the 1980s, Irving and Clara's yard was burned by an anti-Semitic act with a swastika. So that's the picture you see here somewhere in western Nebraska. B. Karp um, was born in uh, Beate Stern in Lauterbach, Germany, 1932. She and her family were forced from their home, transported to internment camps in the south of France. And I'm just bringing you some stories to show you the diversity of these individuals who settled in, in my area. Um, B was saved by the Ose. Um, uh, they came into Rivesalt camp and uh, made an agreement with her mother and she and her sister were taken out of Rivesalt as a result of the Jewish underground. Um, during that time, her parents, uh, who were still interned, wrote letters in Old German, in New German, and we had not translated these until recently. These are the um, uh, artifacts that be kept, um, and all of a sudden we realized that her mother wrote an actual note. Did you receive the sunglasses and the little red pinafore? I left a few things for, for you. Does, it, does the pinafore still fit? Can you wear it? So we suddenly, through this aggregated material, we're suddenly seeing things that B herself didn't even know that she had. Um, this is an example of our um, uh, interactive maps, um, using the digital humanities tool to create three interactive maps. At the moment, the development team provided a way for the visitor to visualize the journeys of B. Carp, Clarence Williams, and Irving Shapiro. These maps include pop-up materials from the collection and linked to outside resources um, 
to obtain further historical context. While some uncertainty regarding exact dates or locations exists due to extreme situations during the war, and we make sure to note that on our website because we don't have those exact, uh, that exact information, um, Clarence Williams uh, wrote 250 letters and we have all of the letters transcribed now in our site and we could follow his material to be able to cre create the map. So we're using different things to be able to um, inform us. Um, Digital Humanities provides a new research tool allowing for a multiple, multitude of options for learning about memory and the Holocaust history. These tools give new meaning to the way we encounter data or artifacts, allowing us to see patterns and survey information at a side-by-side -side perspective that we may not have considered previously. Um, Clarence, once again, there we go. Um, Clarence was in the 42nd Rainbow Division, uh, which was a division that was reinstated after World War I. Um, and there are numerous maps. This is not his, it's from the, the infantry. Um, he is here, and this is one letter that he wrote, if you can see the beautiful handwriting. Um, but his wife would receive the letters, and she would write the place where it was written and the exact date that she received it. So we're able to cross-reference, and we have all of that material. Um, I bought Clarence's son's house, and it's the only way that I have this um, collection. But um, I was going to share some of that letter with you, but the way I'd like to um, conclude is by sharing some information from the intern who actually transcribed these letters. Um, this letter was written on April 30th, 1945, which is the day the 42nd, well, they went in to Dachau on uh, April 28th. He starts out talking about um, the traffic on the streets and, honey, please don't send any more hard-boiled eggs because we're liberating farms and we only eat eggs. And about three pages in, he starts talking about the liberation of Dachau, and he, he describes it in detail to his wife. But this is what my intern, Ethan, uh, read at our launch two weeks ago. I had the honor of reading, transcribing, and encoding around 250 of Clarence's letters in the past two years. One of the big takeaways from that entire experience was that Clarence was a great man living in the worst of times. Stuck in my bedroom, this is the intern, for the first few months of the pandemic, Clarence and I had a lot of alone time. Cl Although Clarence and I never knew me, I often felt that we were having a conversation. The words he wrote often struck me for days or even weeks. There were parallels between what was going on in his life and my own. He missed his family. He grieved the loss of human life. He wanted to see a better world. Over time, I discovered that Clarence and I weren't so different. Although writing 80 years ago, I found that we shared many interests. Clarence was an avid photographer. In fact, he took a, um, a box camera in, and at Auschwitz, or at um, Dachau, he took photos. He took photos the entire, um, the entire uh, tour. Um, he, uh, and Ethan says he extensively documented the war. I also love photography. Clarence loved a game of cards. I also love cards. He never won very often, and neither do I. But Clarence, more than anything else, loved his wife Gretchen and wrote to her nearly every day. He missed her dearly. I also miss my partner sometimes. I obvious, um, but obviously, the circumstances are quite different. I live 10 miles away from my partner. He was 5,000 miles away. And he says, I hope you all get a chance to comb through Clarence's letter. I'm positive that they will again impact you as much as they did me. In particular, his letter to Gretchen after liberating Dachau. It is visceral. His words are seared into my memory. By reading his letters, you too become a witness of human atrocity and engage in the most human of acts, empathy. And he says, it is my belief that studying history is in fact an act of human empathy. By understanding that the life of others, we become uh, better to understand our own life. 
that is why this project is so important and the results um, of this research are so invaluable. Clarence Williams was a great man living in the worst of times. We can all learn from him. And at the end of this letter, this is what Clarence writes. This is probably all boring to you, dear Gretchen, but you just can't picture the sights without seeing them in your own eyes. Well, darling, guess that will be all for today, except to tell you again, I love you worlds. So really this project, uh, while the project, while the goals of the project are to bring disparate materials from outside collections, families, and local resources, the outcome has been much more than just gathering of items. It is about meaning making. We have just begun to understand that these narratives and digital avenues have vast implications. A supportive and creative stakeholder group meets twice annually um, and has been potential or has seen the potential in the use of these varied resources and public events are already sprouting with their organizations. On the educational front, the Nebraska legislature has recently passed an education bill that requires Nebraska schools to teach about the Holocaust and other genocides in a multicultural education classes. This portal provides an excellent resource for educators to adopt among their teaching tools, particularly those in the remote areas of Nebraska. Educational programming and collaborations are a high priority for the next phase of the web website, along with the additional narratives, and of course, more meaning making. Thank you.